This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 399, recorded on July 22nd, 2016. This episode is brought to you by Curiosity Stream a subscription streaming service that offers over 1,400 documentaries and nonfiction series from the world's best filmmakers. Get unlimited access starting at just $2.99 a month. And for our audience, the first two months are completely free if you sign up at curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the promo code microbe. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today here in New York City, Dixon Despommier. Hello there, Vincent Racaniello. Dixon? I've been absolutely fine. I hear you fished this week. I did. Did you catch? I did. Would you catch a rainbow trout? No, no, I didn't catch any rainbows. I caught all browns. Brown trout? All brown trout. You threw them all back, right? Selmo trout, exactly. They all went back. A little less happy than they were before. Because their mouth was ripped out. Right? Not really. No, no, no. I use very small flies, and uh, they don't even feel it. Dixon, it's 33 Celsius at It's the a moment. little bit intense. Ooh. What's the humidity? 51%. <sighs> it's going to get worse tomorrow, but then it's going to get better. It's supposed to rain, though, later. Is it? Oh, well, good. I hope it does. About we can 4 use it. p.m. We can use it. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. Yeah. And it is hot, hot, hot. It's yep. uh, 95 Fahrenheit, 35 C up here. And mm. they're forecasting slight chance of severe thunderstorms and hail and all that sort of thing. Do you have a lot of humidity as well? It's only 36% up here, so it's not bad right at the moment. That but uh, I think it's going to get worse this weekend. I got a lot of bass on you. It's going to sound really cool. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> also joining us. We've got a barbershop quartet here in the making. Yeah. You realize yeah. that? <laughs> now, also joining us today, he's coming from uh, Oregon. Oregon, sorry, Oregon. Rich Condit. Oregon. Howdy, everybody. How are you doing? Howdy. That's the right response, by the way, Rich. Howdy. Uh, <laughs> right. Yeah, that's the Western. I, I missed the temperature in New York. What did you say it was? Oh. 33 Celsius. Now, you want to what know is, what that is. Yeah. It's 33 Celsius, dude. It's like 90. Uh, it's in the 90s. 90, 90, 90, okay. It's hot. And what is it there? Yeah. It is here, 68 Fahrenheit, 20 Celsius. Oh. Oh. Clear blue sky, nice. absolutely gorgeous. It was 48 <sighs> degrees Fahrenheit when I got up this morning. Oh, neat. Nice. But you didn't say where you were. Oh, you are in which I, I, am, where? I am in Sun River, Oregon, a little south of Bend, on the eastern slopes of the Cascade Mountains in the high desert. Outstanding. Yep. It's gorgeous. So this is our first episode in a couple of weeks. Last one was at ASV, I think. Right? Yeah, it's more than a couple of weeks. It's like three weeks or four weeks. Four weeks, weeks four weeks. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, Alan, next year, next summer, uh, we're going to do an ASV at Madison, Wisconsin, and you should come. Uh, we'll pay your way. Yeah, hey, that'd be great. Because <laughs> now we have some money from our wonderful Would you pay my supporters way? and your... Um, <laughs> and our uh, our Patreon patrons, so we could you Dixon. Yeah, what about me? Uh, I Come tried on. once, and you canned out at the last minute. So I know, but I, I wouldn't never can out. I, no, no, I, this is Madison, Wisconsin. You don't you don't say no to that. I might, I might send That's you out. Town. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so put that on your calendar. What does, what is mind. the day? Of course, you don't have to go. I understand if you don't want to. But let, let me tell you the let me tell you the dates. Please. It is uh, June 24th through the 28th. Magic time. Actually, the 25th that's, through that's the 28th. Yeah. yeah. Plenty of mosquitoes. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking, Speaking of Zika. Speaking of mosquitoes. So I've been away for three weeks. That's why we had interview twivs posted. Uh, Where'd you go, Vincent? I went to Japan oh, with, cool. uh, with most of the family. We, we our, older, our older son couldn't come because he's working, but... My wife and two younger kids. We went for three weeks, traveled around Japan. It was awesome. I loved it. Man, oh, yeah. what a great country. It's really cool. I highly cool. recommend it. And so, um, but I did arrange for Twivs in my absence. So uh, I, don't, I know people like to get them. So you right. got them. And of course, since we haven't talked about Zika for four weeks now, we will talk about Zika today. 
the the um, barrage of papers is slightly slowing down. <laughs> I have a folder where we've been collecting Zika papers. And you remember at the out, at the onset of the outbreak, what were, there were fifty papers since nineteen forty seven. Right. And I, this folder has now five hundred papers in it. Nice. Oh my God! Do they all say the same thing? <laughs> no, they say some of them do. <laughs> right. But you know, each one has some issues. They're not all yeah. really great. <laughs> well, right. today we have one that I really like. Anyway, I thought we'd do a little follow up, cover some things. Um, if you if you're interested in, I know we have lots of international uh, listeners, but uh, here in the U.S., uh, the CDC keeps a track of all the cases. Now, in the continental U.S., that doesn't include Puerto Rico, American Samoa, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Continental U.S., locally. Or Hawaii or Alaska. Uh, really? <laughs> but it's not continental. Yeah, I know, but. You know, Hawaii it certainly isn't. Hawaii has had some imported. Oh. Well, anyway. Well, they, they have data for the U.S. states, which would be. Yeah, well, that Alaska, counts. No, that, that's a better way. So I shouldn't say continental. No, you shouldn't. Okay, fine. No. Uh, there are zero locally acquired cases, although there there's so one far. in Florida which they think might be locally acquired, but we don't know for sure yet. Even if there is, I wouldn't be surprised. There are going to be a few. Sure. Travel associated cases one thousand four hundred and three. Goodness. There's one laboratory associated case, fifteen sexually transmitted cases, and five Guillain Barre. I'll be darned. Um, in U.S. territories. That's what they call them, Dixon. Right. Puerto Rico, American Samoa, and yeah, yeah. U.S. Virgin Islands. Yep. Locally acquired cases. Wow, 3,815. Yeah, that's right. Only 12 travel associated cases. Because they've got the right vectors. And yeah, 14 Guillaume Barre. I love to say Guillaume Barre. Do. <laughs> Just like I love saying Reduvido. <laughs> <laughs> but you wouldn't like yeah. to have Guillaume Barre. <laughs> no, and the vast no. majority, vast majority of those Zika cases are in Puerto Rico. Yeah, right. they have a lot there. Right. They have a big outbreak. A few, a few in American Samoa and the U.S. Virgin Islands, but the ninety-eight percent of them are in uh, Puerto Rico. So our friend Tyler Sharp is busy. He is busy. Hmm. Now, right here in the U.S., there is a suspected female-to-male transmission here in New York City, actually. Which I think we predicted. We did predict. We said if it's sexually transmitted male to female, it ought to be sexually transmitted female to male. Right. So this is a, a uh, non-pregnant woman in her 20s. She um, returned to New York City f- after travel to an area with ongoing Zika. On the day she returned, she had condomless uh, vaginal intercourse with, her, with a male partner. And then the following day, she developed fever, fatigue, rash, myalgia, etc. On day three, she went to the doctor and gave blood and urine Zika RNA detected in both by PCR, and they found Zika virus IgM as well in serum. Um, did they? Yeah, the results of serum. Oh, sorry, they were negative. Negative. <clears throat> yes, negative for IgM. So Zika RNA in serum and urine by PCR. But no antibodies. Mm, no antibodies. And then seven days after sexual intercourse, the woman's male part- partner developed similar symptoms, went to the doctor, uh, Zika virus RNA in urine, but not serum. No an- no IgM antibodies either. Right. And no other obvious way that he could have contracted the disease. No travel history. Uh, Didn't uh, recall being bitten by a mosquito. Yeah. Right. No blood transfusion. No, in con- right. no blood transfusion. Now, in connection with this... I found an article, uh, I believe it was in The Lancet. I have so many articles up here. How am I going to find them? Here we go. <laughs> Zika virus in the female genital tract. It's a little a short little correspondence from uh, investigators in Guadeloupe. And this is a young woman, um, 27 years old. She was um, identified as having Zika infection in May 20, uh, 2016. And they did uh, a genital swab, an endocervical swab, and a cervical mucus sample was collected. All were positive for Zika RNA by PCR. Mm. On day 11, the blood and urine were negative. And at that time, uh, the cervical mucus was still positive by PCR. So apparently the viral RNA, at least, can be present in the uh, female genital tract. So that could be how 
was transmitted to the man, although I think it still could be saliva or urine, right? Right. right. And with the, with the CDC report, the first one, mm-hmm. um, <clears throat> which the, it, it's been touted by everybody as, as um, sexual transmission, female to male, um, and I agree that the data are consistent with that. Mm-hmm. But I'm a little puzzled that nobody was antibody positive and the, um, the man's serum was uh, RT-PCR negative. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so, you know, it's not, it's not absolutely clear. Uh, so, wait a minute. His serum was RT-PCR negative? Yes. His urine How was is- positive. Oh, his urine was positive. Okay, fine. Because the other thing is missing from this that I hope will appear eventually is a sequence analysis of the viruses involved. Yes. Uh, maybe. We'll see. I was um, uh, curious about the um, this paper on Zika virus in the female genital tract, how it came to be that this study was done. But then I noticed that uh, the majority of the researchers are in the Caribbean Center for Reproductive Medicine. Right. And so they're in the business of doing this kind of thing. And they say, I'm not sure exactly what this means, but um, the patient was monitored for oocyte cryopreservation because we follow the French Agence de la Biomedicine recommendations for infertile patients in Zika virus infected areas. Uh, yeah, that was a little bit. Uh, so she she appears to have had um, the part of the part of a fertility treatment protocol done, and yes. then then, then they we found lead this into out. right. Then we lead into the genital swab and a cervical swab. So I don't know. I don't know exactly what the um, whole picture was here. There was apparently there was more going on than just. Uh, apparent Zika virus infection. Yeah, it's not clear. It's a little. Uh, yeah. It's a little bit uh, briefly written. So, we but don't for know. some reason, they did these <laughs> yeah. swabs yeah. and they came back positive for Zika, and they remained positive for Zika RNA after uh, she seems to have cleared the virus from. I blood. mean, my interpretation is that she was going to give oocytes, and they were checking to see if there was virus oh. present, and okay. that, yeah, I, and that's why they were doing this. So she's the, an egg donor. Yeah. Okay. Right. That that's the the text is vague, but that would be my story. Yeah. Okay. That would make sense. So that's why they would be doing these swabs. Right. This is not routinely done for anybody who shows up with Zika virus. But just remember these um, so these so called sexually transmitted cases are very very rare compared to all the others transmitted by mosquito bite. Yes. Do yeah. we know if dengue can be transmitted this way? Uh, sexually transmitted. Yeah. Hmm. Let's look. Let's just search Dixon. I, I, I'm, uh, actually, uh, so I think if you look back at the CDC sort of Zika update that you did before and do the math uh, in the U.S., there uh, we're talking about what? About 1% sexually transmitted. Yes, yeah, something like 15, that. Uh, 15 out of 1,400. Just slightly more than 1%. And, of, and of course... Well, those are presumed sexual transmission, seem to be sexual transmission. So I guess that's about what we were reporting before, about 1%. Mm-hmm. And I'm getting, I'm getting a lot of Zika papers when I'm searching for on PubMed for dengue sexual transmission. Yeah, I got one here, myths about dengue. It is not sexually transmitted. Right, so just trying to fit that into the general biology of the Flavic group. I don't know why this uh, would be different, Dixon, but, um, you know... Apparently it is. It is. That's it is what it is, right? Well, and nobody uh, dengue has not been linked with um, birth defects, has it? No, no. There's been just very a couple of reports of uh, crossing the placenta, yeah, but certainly nothing like Zika. So there are differences. So yeah, it may be that this that Zika virus can get into places that dengue virus can't. Yep, it's all about receptors, right? That's one of the things, uh, Dixon. But it's other things as well. It's not just receptors. Okay. Someday that will be the title of an episode. It's not just the receptor. <laughs> well, it could, we could make that today's title. Why not? No, we have another. We have another addition to the list of choices here, which I we do have some. I came up with one, which you guys might. Um, we have an interesting case in Utah. We don't have a lot of information on that, but this is an elderly Utah resident. He died in June. He had traveled to an area where there was Zika, 
and he acquired infection. Had apparently a lot of, uh, so they say, he had unique, the CDC says he had uniquely high amounts of virus in his blood, but what they really mean is viral RNA, I'm sure. Right. Because they're not looking at infectious virus. Mm. And then he was cared for um, by, I think, a family friend who then acquired infection. And and, and this made the New York Times. How old was the guy, it, by the way? Oh, he was older than you, Dixon. That's really old. That's really old. <laughs> um, <laughs> Ancient. I'm not sure. They don't actually say. They just say elderly. Elderly, because they want to protect his identity. Apparently immunocompromised, though, yes. They could have been, yes. Yeah. Do you feel immunocompromised? Not even the least. Not in the least. <laughs> anyway, so the New York Times headline, Zika virus baffles health officials. You know, here's the, here's what I'm thinking. You have an elderly person who's being cared for. There's probably a bedpan involved with urine, and we know the virus is in the bedpan, and those things slop around when you... So why is it baffling that the caregiver got infected? You know, if they have cuts on their hands or, you know... Yeah. I guess that's probably how it happened, right? Yeah, sure. What do you think, guys and gals? Uh, sounds no really gals. Sure. Sounds about, yeah. Uh, yeah. What... what what it was probably not sexually what, transmitted. What was not clear to me is who knows. It, it looked, it looked, <laughs> Sorry, Dick. That's it looked okay. as if there was a fair amount of time elapsed between mm-hmm. the caretaking and this guy showing up with the disease. Am I right about that, or is I'm just looking at the reporting? Maybe it's uh, not clear. I'm not sure. I, I let's look at the. The only thing I have is. There's a few newspaper articles. Not a and lot the C- of actually, the right. CDC thing doesn't really have any dates. The CDC no. is just a CDC thing is just a press release. Right. Okay. So I guess I no, guess we no, don't have uh, any information. No. Hmm. You don't no, really have no any timing. Information. No information. This is just okay. for your information. Um, this, you know, I hate to do things like this when there's no data, but you know, it reminds me a lot of a lot of other situations that have occurred over my lifespan in terms of viral infections, like HIV, for instance, mm-hmm. when it first mm-hmm. came out. Everybody's throwing up their arms. What are you going to do? It's this, it's that, the other. And finally, when they pin it down, everybody starts to relax, and then you know, you can take measures to prevent. And that's probably going to be the case for this as well. Yeah. So but meanwhile, the, the, the field, the, the press is having a field day with trying to again. It's not fear mongering necessarily, but it's getting close to that. You know, raising undue suspicion about things that uh, will probably turn out not to be true. Uh, this gentleman did have a lot of the the initial contact patient did have a lot of uh, RNA in his blood, a hundred thousand times higher than seen seen in other samples of infected people. Right. So mm-hmm. that's incredible. Mm-hmm. he was he was carrying a big load. So he's, he's probably, kind of a super spreader. Probably. Uh, yeah, I was, that's know, what I was thinking. I mean, so you think he sports. died from it? We don't really know, we don't know. what he died of. He, we don't yeah, know anything no. about his health, right? We just know that he's elderly. We haven't heard anything about deaths from Zika, even in utero. Does it cause stillbirths? Well, the babies die, right? Yep. Yeah, yep. sure. It does cause stillbirths. Yeah, yeah. It can, sure. can cause stillbirths, yes. For sure, okay. yes. Okay. But uh, adults? No. 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 This is the, I think this is the first case in the right. U.S. anyway. Right. And careful. the caregiver? Caregiver's fine. Caregiver's fine. All right, another interesting topic that's been uh, bandying about is, well, as everyone knows, the Olympics will soon start in in Rio, yep. in Brazil, where there's been quite a bit of Zika. And uh, I just have been amused by listening to athletes saying they're not going to go. Or they will go. <laughs> or they will go. Right. And, and I've always thought, why wouldn't you go? I mean, if exactly. you know, the biggest risk here is for a, a pregnant woman, right? And I don't think the, the female athletes are necessarily pregnant or are going to get pregnant. That's not compatible with athletic performance, right? Right. Or am I speaking incorrectly? Uh, I, I think it's pretty safe to say that in most sports, they, they don't want to be pregnant while they're competing in the Olympics. Right. So anyway, the CDC just did a risk assessment. It's in mo- Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. And the first thing they point out is that the, the Olympics are happening between August and September. And this is winter. Right in Brazil, so mosquito activity is going to be lower than you'd hardly know it by the usual. temperature and humidity. What is it? Well, right. <laughs> it's pretty hot down there. Well, they say that the transmission is expected to be lower, but it's it's um, I mean it's tropical country, so you don't really think of it as winter. It's the right. dry season, but it's cooler and drier, <clears throat> and the populations right. are reduced, not eliminated for sure. That's right. Anyway, they did a risk assessment, and if you want to know exactly how they did this, the details are in the article. But basically, what they found. Um, is that um, 19 countries who are currently not reporting Zika outbreaks have the 
environmental conditions, and population susceptibility to sustain mosquito-borne transmission if a case were imported from infection at the game. So here's the concern that people will go to the games and then go back home infected and then release uh, the virus will be picked up by mosquitoes. So they say for 15 of these 19 countries, travel to Rio during the games is not estimated to increase substantially the level of risk above that incurred by the usual aviation travel baseline. They're basically saying it's not going to really make a difference in the, in the amount of people going back and forth. Right. Which I found very interesting. Apparently, they looked at data from prior Olympics, yeah. and they found that it doesn't increase travel to the location of the Olympics, which I guess, you know, how many people are going to travel halfway around the world to see the Olympics? That's a, a an interesting but rather extravagant trip. Yeah. Um, it's basically going to be the athletes, and there you're not talking about millions of people. You're you're talking about a small subset. Um, so apparently, if you look at the travel data, the Olympics really don't affect the the number of people traveling there. Yeah. So there. Yeah. What, what what we typically don't take into account is that travel to places like Rio. There's a lot of travel That's in right. and out of That's Rio right. all the time. And Thir- so 39 the million, is- yeah, 39 million passenger journeys to the United States from all Zika affected countries and territory and U.S. territories in 2015. <laughs> right. right. So the so the Olympics is a drop in the bucket. That's a very interesting perspective. I found this article fascinating. I really like it. Yes. Mm-hmm. So there are four it's a, countries- good, a good debunker. There are four <laughs> countries that um, where the risk might be increased. These are Chad, Djibouti, Eritrea, and Yemen. They're unique. They don't have a substantial number of travelers to any country with local Zika transmission, except for the games. These four countries will be represented by a total of 19 athletes, right. <laughs> which is a tiny yeah. fraction of the 350,000 to 500,000 visitors expected at the game. And some of those countries have problems a lot bigger than Zika. Yes. Right. Remember, this yes. is an Aedes uh, aegypti transmitted disease, and that's a tree hole breeder, and that's... Uh, dependent upon um, rain events. And if this is the dry season, it's probable they won't get any rain for the length of the games itself. So they may not have any uh, vector increases at all during that time. Right. And I think that's why they're trying to assuage uh, worries. So TWIV officially gives the Olympics a light. <laughs> exactly. Okay? Go ahead. Could, do it. Go game, do it. The games can go on. Yes. Well, they do make recommendations here. They say pregnant women should not travel to the games. That's probably a good idea. Of course, right. if right. you live there and you're pregnant. Huh. <laughs> might as well. <laughs> you're, um, <laughs> if you live in Rio, you might as well go to the games. Because you've be- already been exposed. <laughs> uh, mosquito bites should be avoided while traveling and for three weeks after returning home. That's a... That's a trite statement to say yeah. anything about. Come on, avoid being yeah, bitten by true. mosquitoes. That's the best way to prevent malaria, too, by the way. It's uh, the best just, way to prevent a whole bunch of things. Just yes. go try that someday, kids. And finally, measures should be taken to prevent sexual transmission. During the Olympics? Are you no, no, kidding? No, when you get home. When you get home. <laughs> oh, well, <no>. well <laughs> some people go down there just for that. So. Actually, while at the Olympics and yeah. after returning home. Yeah, it's a home. party. It's a big yes. party, let's face it. So you have to use condoms. Yeah. You know, or abstain from sex. So but I guess the biggest caveat you could say is that forget about the Olympics. Let's worry about uh, Mardi Gras <laughs> and the Carnival <laughs> because that that's going to occur right at the time that this transmission cycle should be at its height. Right. They get a lot. Anyway, of this uh, this uh, is sent to all the athletes, particularly there were a bunch of golfers who said they weren't going to go. Exactly. Although it turns out. They're That's not because going. there's no prize money. There's no prize money. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> hey, Rich, did they, did they get down to your level yet <laughs> to say, okay, we'll take content to hell with it? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, a couple, six months ago, some of the f- um, female soccer team members said they weren't going to go, but now they're going. They changed their mind. Yeah, um, that's right. Female basketball team's going. They should go. There's no reason not to go. Of course. You just don't want to get pregnant within, you know, what, six months or a year after going. And just be careful. All right, that's the Olympic, the Zika Olympics, we should call them. The Zika Olympics, yes. Zika Olympics. Zika. Now, a little bit about Zika vaccines. Uh-huh. Wow, there are 15, at least 15 companies working on vaccines against Zika virus. Wow, that's a lot. I, I cannot, it even Ebola, there weren't 15 companies working no, on this Ebola. This sounds like vaccines. more global outlook. Of course, outlook, right? absolutely, absolutely. And they know so, what vectors, I understand so, that. Yeah, right, right. And... Um, I wanted to talk about one, 
which has just been published. There's a paper published on it. It's been published in Nature, an accelerated article preview. Mm. It's called Vaccine Protection Against Zika Virus from Brazil. Mm. There's a a large group of uh, individuals from Harvard Medical School, University of Sao Paulo, and um, the Walter Reed Institute, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But what this is is cool. It's a DNA vaccine. They take uh, DNA encoding uh, the glycoprotein, the, the E glycoprotein, and the PRM, which is a smaller uh, glycoprotein on the virus particle surface associated with it. So DNA encoding it, and they inoculate mice intramuscularly with the purified plasmid DNA. Dixon, have you ever heard of this? Of course. Of course. Okay, I, I just want to make sure you're up be with nice. the Be nice. Be nice to Dixon. <laughs> I said it in a nice way. I know, but you implied... Total ignorance on the part of the listener. <laughs> so these um, mice respond by producing antibodies within a couple of weeks, which you can detect by ELISA, by, by uh, Western blot, mm-hmm. and they're neutralizing antibodies. Mm-hmm. Mice also make virus-specific T cells. Mm-hmm. Mo- so I know what they are too, by the way. Yes. <laughs> uh, and then uh, they challenge these mice uh, with uh, Zika virus. So it's a single immunization with 50 micrograms of plasma DNA. They challenge them, and the uh, immunized mice develop no viremia, whereas the uh, mock Im- or the control immunized mice develop a nice, robust, as they say, viremia. So it completely protects against Hang on developing a, a viremia. Is this virus promiscuous in terms of host specificity? No, it's not promiscuous, but it will infect mice. And what else? Uh, non-human primates. Humans, other rodents. I don't know about other rodents. I don't uh, think you know, it the, inf- the infection of mice is sort of a. It's a the mouse can serve as a model, yeah. so it's a laboratory right. thing. Right. It's the, a, they they can't serve as a reservoir, but the receptor is there. Apparently, Dixon. Right. right? So it's so these or are, a receptor is there. a receptor. A re- is there. I'm sorry. These are Balb C mice, and they don't develop disease. They develop a viremia, right. and they and it's uh are copies per mil like. 10 to the 6th, 10 to the 7th copies per mil at peak time. That's at about three days after inoculation. And then they clear it, and the mice are fine. But this uh, DNA vaccination completely prevents the viremia. Right. So, And this the infection route here is IV or IM or something? With the virus, the challenge? Right, the challenge. The challenge, I believe, is IV. <clears throat> okay. Let's just check. Yes, they are challenged IV. When you say the and, mice are all right, did they check their brains to see if they had any virus <laughs> they in them? Them to the opera? They didn't check their brains. They no. did not? No, they didn't. Wouldn't you? I would have, yes, but they didn't. Of course you would have. But I am not them, Dixon. No, you're not, but you are you. <laughs> <laughs> and we are all together. And we are uh, all together. I think, I think the point is that the virus doesn't um, seem to replicate or, or get to high titer, so these, these mice are neutralizing it. No, no, I, I got that part. Now, the interesting thing is, Dixon, they deplete the mice of, of uh, T and B cells right. after immunization, and they're still protected. Uh-huh. So they conclude that antibody is what's important. In fact, they can purify IgG from these immunized mice. And, and they passively will, they will pass Yes, they will passively protect another mouse. So it looks like the correlate of protection uh, is antibody. Makes sense. Which Not is only great. that, but the, the, the specificity that's important is the to the E glycoprotein. That's correct. The, the, right. the, 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 they don't, they don't as, from what I could tell, they don't have antibodies specific for M. And yet, if they try and make the vaccine without M mm-hmm. and just express E, that doesn't work. Doesn't work. That's right. So that's interesting. It, it implies to me, uh, so I'm totally making this up, <laughs> but I wonder if uh, for the DNA vaccine to work properly, you need both PRM and E there so that the protein is properly assembled and presented maybe on the cell surface or something. I don't I, I don't know. No, that wouldn't be right. No, the protein is just like an adjuvant? No, usually it's a peptide that's presented on the cell surface. Yeah. Right. right. But, but, but you do the – so I don't have an explanation for this, but you do need M and E in order to get – Yep. The uh, response, even though the response is only to E. That's interesting. That's correct. Right. But it's great news that um, that antibodies appear to be protective. Yes. Because mm-hmm. making making a vaccine right. that elicits an antibody response is something that we are very, very well equipped to do, which I think yeah. is 
I think that's mm-hmm. a big part of the reason. I think there are two major reasons why so many companies are interested in this. Um, one, as compared to Ebola, um, one is that the um, the virus is relatively easy to work on. This is not a BSL-4 pathogen. So you don't have to have yep. a BSL-4 factory in order to develop the vaccine. Uh, and the other is that there's a pretty clear path I mean, we kind of suspected from just the epidemiology of this that uh, uh, it would not be all that horrible, horribly difficult to come up with some kind of a vaccine. So it seems like there's a pretty good shot of it. And the, the potential market's huge. Oh, yeah. And the that's oh, yeah. the last statement. Alan. Yes, that that's the most relevant right. statement. That is actually the most <laughs> relevant part. The, the potential market for an Ebola vaccine could have been pretty big because well. um, there was a lot of fear surrounding it. But, but it didn't leave West Africa, though. And and the barriers to developing that were substantial. And and in this case, those things are all exactly the opposite way. You know, exactly. it looks like looks like there's a path to a product that will sell a lot of bottles. Right. Yeah. The other the other part of this paper is that uh, sort of as a uh, confirmation that we're looking at antibody to a surface protein. Uh, they make an inactivated virus uh, vaccine and do that and that and and that works as well. So uh, it all makes sense, as you say, Alan, that this, there's a clear path to a vaccine and a number of different technological routes to it. And now that said, I think we're going to talk about some stuff in a few minutes that may complicate this picture a bit. This, um, so a DNA vaccine is very handy because a lot easier to prepare than a, a virus vaccine of any kind. Right. Right, all you need is DNA. Yeah. Now, we don't have any approved human DNA viral vaccines. Um, I believe that's the case. This, this could be the first. There is a West Nile vaccine for horses, I understand. That's a DNA-based vaccine. Uh, but this would be the first. Now, here's the question. We've got this mouse experiment. What do you have to do next before you mm-hmm. do a phase one in people? Do you need another animal experiment? I believe you do. Ferrets. A, non, a non-human ferrets. primate. <laughs> okay, a non-human primate. Those are available. The, the FDA yeah. is going to want to see at least a, at least probably a few different animal experiments. Yes. So what would be the fastest this could come to market? You, mm. What do you think? Two years? Three years? Somewhere in that time zone if everything goes perfectly. Yeah. All right, and then the other question is, who would get this vaccine? Anybody who wants it? So all uh, everybody in Brazil? Could be a cocktail along with your yellow fever vaccine. You know, when you ask this question, what comes to mind is a conversation we had a while ago about the rubella vaccine that's been available <laughs> that's been available for such a long time yeah, that's right. under that's right. under similar circumstances, and yet not everybody gets it. So I would guess that uh in the U.S., it would be a travel-related vaccine. If you're going to go to a Zika endemic country, you should get it, just like yellow fever vaccine at the yeah. moment. If you yeah. go mm-hmm. travel somewhere, including Brazil, where there's yellow fever, you get the, that vaccine. It'll depend on how much transmission we have <clears throat> in the U.S. Yeah. If, if we get a little transmission in Texas and Florida, you can imagine them immunizing there. That, right. that could squash that. But what about Brazil and Colombia and Mexico now? Where uh, in uh, many other countries where the virus is circulating, would you um, just target pregnant women or women in general of childbearing age? Hmm. I think, given what we're going to talk about in a few minutes with the antibody interactions, potential antibody interactions yeah, yeah. with dengue, um, one of the things that I would certainly want to see before before weighing in on that is. <clears throat> um, uh, how much of a problem is that going to be for dengue? Yeah, for dengue. You know, because if if yeah. you go and you vaccinate everybody in in Puerto Rico against Zika virus, and now everybody gets dengue shock syndrome from you know yeah, sec- yeah. infection of dengue, then then you really have not helped. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, but, uh, that's, but that's assuming a t- assuming you can get around that, if you can develop a vaccine that does not carry that risk, then you would want to push ahead ahead with it as much as possible, I think. Yeah, of course. I hate to say this, but the best control against Zika virus is the vector control. Really? Well, yes. Yeah. That's so not- in Puerto Rico, that's what they would have to do. They would have to double up on their control programs for, for tree hole breeding mosquito species. Right. Yeah, you know, uh, Peter Hotez wrote an article about that recently, Dixon, 
oh, thing good. that we should, you know, we never should have stopped our vector control program yeah. here in the U.S. This is true. Well, we did. Um, I don't think we did stop. No, he says we did. No, we just cut back on them. Cut we back. Cut, we cut back far <clears throat> enough that we might as well have stopped. Because we have mosquito control boards in most states, and uh, there are epidemics of, or, well, not epidemics, but outbreaks right, but of a lot encephalitis. Of- but a lot of states, um, the mosquito control oh, efforts are, are more for show than anything else. You know, they go yeah, around, spray. they spray adulticides in, in yeah, areas. they do it wrong. They do it yeah, wrong. that's a nice idea, but it doesn't really get at the problem, and you yeah. need to go and do yeah. do proper habitat elimination. Uh, Hotez pointed out in that article that this spraying is ridiculous it because is. within a few minutes it's sure. ineffective, right? Right. All right. That's right. Uh, the the next paper I thought would be uh, interesting to comment on is a paper, an article in the New England Journal of Medicine, which uh, summarizes the state of Zika in Colombia so far. Zika virus yeah. disease in Colombia, preliminary report. <clears throat> and uh, as everyone knows, um, Colombia got Zika shortly after uh, Brazil did. And by April of this year, there were 65,726 cases of Zika virus disease reported in Colombia, and 4% of those were confirmed by PCR. Uh, That's only 2,400, so not a lot. Um, And um, 11,944 pregnant women with Zika virus disease were reported, uh, 1,400 of those confirmed by PCR. In a subgroup of 1,850 pregnant women, over 90% who were infected in the third trimester had already given birth. No infants would apparent abnormalities identified so far. And there have been a number of women, of course, infected in the first or second trimester. They are still pregnant at the time of this report, so we don't know what's going to happen to them. What I found interesting here, though, this is why I actually picked this. Um, Four patients had laboratory evidence of congenital Zika virus disease. Uh, These were babies born to asymptomatic mothers. So these are mothers who were infected, apparently, and their children uh, had microcephaly, and they, the mothers had no symptoms. So you can uh, transmit the virus to the fetus even if you don't have symptoms. We have, we have asked this in the past on the show, so that's why right. I thought it was interesting. Um, one thing that, <clears throat> that took a little digging to pull out from the paper because they kind of scattered it around was um, uh, as I was reading the the incidence information, you know, 65,000 patients reported to have Zenga vi- uh, uh, Zika virus disease. Um, that is based on symptoms. Right. And then this small subset were actually tested for Zika virus. And the first thing I thought was, well, what proportion of the group that you tested came out positive? Mm. Because that would give you an indication of the quality of your surveillance program. Uh, these, The symptoms for Zika virus are very generic for the most part so you could be putting a lot of people into that bin who don't belong there um but they do actually say 73 percent of the samples that they that they took um had positive rt-pcr results Hmm. so that that if that holds for the general 65,000 people who were reported that would suggest that their um symptom-based reporting is actually pretty good yeah Yep. So those are those are probably probably a substantial proportion of those sixty five thousand people uh, would have come out PCR positive had they been tested. And among the PCR negative ones, they did find folks who who tested positive for dengue and chikungunya. Right. So you get expected results there too. A lot of infections there. Yes. From one little bite, perhaps. But but yeah, it's very interesting that the. The third trimester pregnancies that have now come to term, yes. that doesn't seem to be a, a big problem, and that's very encouraging. It's good, yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, now... Perhaps it relates to the development of the immunity yes. system of the fetus. Yeah, yeah. I think uh-huh. I think what we're kind of maybe getting toward is, is a realization that maybe a particular phase in pregnancy is the critical part, and maybe. that's when you need to be especially careful. I like think it's very, it's very common for congenital infections to, to have the earlier stages yep. of pregnancy yes. uh, more susceptible than the later stages. Right. True. All right, moving on. Here is a paper which the topic of this we have 
discussed previously, and it was a very hmm, a little contentious discussion. Con- contentious discussion. Uh, this paper is published in PNAS. It's called "Human Antibody Responses After Dengue Virus Infection Are Highly Cross-Reactive to Zika Virus," <laughs> and this is a group from Emory, uh, Thailand, um, Faculty of Medicine there in Bangkok. Um, where else? Emory, University of Chicago. University of Chicago. I think those are the main ones. And what they've done here is to look at uh, antibodies to dengue virus. There are two different kinds. They have a serum from patients in Thailand who were in fact, who were dengue positive, and they also have monoclonal antibodies which they isolate uh, from patients. And they ask two questions: One, do these antibodies cross react with Zika? And the answer is yes. Both the sera and the monoclonals do cross react. They not only bind the virus, but they can neutralize infectivity. Mm-hmm. But the real uh, part that I want to talk about here is uh, the results which show that dengue antibodies can enhance Zika virus infection of cells that bear FC receptors. So they tested these five sera and 11 monoclonals, uh, whether they can enhance Zika infection. These This is a cell line, it's a monocyte cell line called U937, and they have receptors for the FC portion of antibodies. And so normally the virus Zika will not infect these cells, but in the presence of these dengue antibodies, the the virus can infect. And that's called antibody-dependent enhancement. And that's why we're worried about Zika and dengue cross-reactive antibodies because they can make uh, the disease worse at the right concentrations. Which is not just a theoretical thing. I mean, we see this with dengue virus. People who've had the first, we've talked about this on TWIV before, people who've had dengue virus are are more susceptible to a more severe illness the second time around. Right. Now, you may remember, um, uh, let's see, I think it was back in the beginning of May, we talked about a bioarchive preprint from Sharon Isern's lab in Florida, where where they reported essentially the same or right. similar findings using different antibodies, I presume, that antibodies to dengue can um, allow Zika infection of FC-bearing receptors. And there was a lot of discussion about that, whether we should have talked about it because it was a bioarchive paper. And in particular, we got a letter from uh, Mehul Suthar, saying, you know, you shouldn't talk about this. It could be this. We don't have these controls, blah, blah, blah. Well, it turns out that Mahul is an author on this paper. Uh-huh. And I do hope that his pre- his doing this work did not influence his comments, which he sent to Twitter. Right? <laughs> no. How could you possibly think that? I just hope he didn't do that. Anyway, the paper was sent out for review on May 7th, and we talked about this on May 8th, so the timing is is just about right. (laughs) Now, I should point out that Sharon's paper has not yet been published. Mm. It is is mired in a difficult review, shall we say, Mm. and I do hope that none of the authors on this paper are involved in that review. That would be really unfortunate and and sad because she was right. Her results are correct, you know, right. and she put this out a long time ago. But this is the way science goes. This is the, these are the things that happen now. With the existence of bioarchive, who gets precedence here? Uh, I don't know. No, yeah. I mean the the whole idea of bioarchive is that you get an early publication date. Yes. So if her paper, I hope it will be eventually. If it eventually gets out, then uh, she 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 has an early publication date. It's true. But right now it's not published, and people will just say, "Ah, you don't know if it's right." Blah, blah you know. Oh, Sharon, uh, I have very little doubt, but that Sharon will get a good share of the credit for this observation. Yes, that just I hope so. makes sense to me. In fact, there was an uh, article in Science um, describing this PNAS paper's results, and they talked to Sharon, and they actually mentioned the fact that she had published it in BioArchive uh, and that it was under review. Good. So she got the credit, which is good. 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 So there's a couple of things about this paper uh, that interest me. First of all, once again, the focus is on E as apparently an immunodominant antigen, confirming what we saw uh, in the other paper. And the second was a technological thing <clears throat> that you guys may be familiar with, but was a, a revelation to me. And that is they're talking about human monoclonal antibodies. Yep. And I was wondering to myself, 
how do you make a human monoclonal antibody? And it turns out that you can uh, do appropriate sorting of plasma blasts, and then they don't do fusions or anything like that. They just clone the antibody genes, yeah. heavy and light chain, and right. express them uh, in a cultured cell, and that's your monoclonal. That's My right. God. Isn't that cool? Yeah, that's how you get these. That's how you get these broadly neutralizing flu, yeah. HIV, and now dengue, flavivirus antibodies. It's very cool. It's just stuff we could never do before. Yeah. Now, while we're, these are, of course, antibodies to dengue that um, enhance Zika virus infection, the converse is also true. There's a paper that came out in Science, which I didn't put on this list. Um, it's called Specificity, Cross-Reactivity, and Function of Antibodies Elicited by Zika Virus Infection. They show that antibodies that are elicited by Zika virus infection, uh, they cross-react with dengue, and they enhance dengue infection in cells, and they enhance dengue disease in a mouse model. Mm, okay, so that's so important. Goes that last bit. Ways. Yes, so there is a mouse model for serious uh, dengue disease enhanced by antibodies, and antibodies to Zika uh, do that as well. So this is why both vaccines against Zika and dengue, as Alan pointed out before, are somewhat problematic because we don't want to make disease worse with one right. or the other. It also potentially impacts on the epidemiology of these diseases. Okay, right. so yeah, in a, for sure. a, uh, the epidemiology of a Zika uh, infection in a dengue uh, endemic country could be different than elsewhere. For sure. Though, for sure. I suppose likely dengue and Zika are going to be uh, co circulating almost all the time. Yes. You know, I was talking to Peter Palazzi a couple of weeks ago, and he said that, um, so there is a vaccine for tick-borne encephalitis virus, which is another flavy that cross-reacts with dengue and Zika. And this is a, primarily a European-given uh, vaccine. Mm. And a lot of Europeans like to vacation in South America. In fact, the Holland Caribbean, is now right? suffering from an outbreak. So of tick-borne encephalitis? Yep. Just right around. So that's that. another vaccine you have to worry about in terms of making either dengue or Zika virus disease worse. Yeah. So what know. we need is a good dengue vaccine. <laughs> it elicits <laughs> DH1 responses. Yeah, we do need a good dengue vaccine. And uh, we'll have one someday. There is there is a vaccine, but it's not that good. It's the Sanofi right. product, <clears throat> Dengvaxia. If there's so much cross-reactivity, I wonder if there isn't the potential ultimately to make some sort of uh, appropriately pan virus specific um, vaccine. Right. Yes, That'll yes get all for sure. Up. Well, right now there is a, I mean, we use a pan antibody in the lab, which is directed against a, an epitope on E, the fusion loop on the e-glycoprotein, mm -hmm. and that's highly conserved among flavies. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I think you could. I think you could do that, but it'd have to be more than one epitope, otherwise you would get escape, right? Mm. So. Right. But you know, that's going to be the longer term. The short term is the easy stuff like the DNA-based vaccine. Yep. Right. Right. And the, and the DNA vaccine, the DNA-based vaccine would still probably have a market among travelers who are dengue naive. For sure. Yes. Right. <clears throat> All right. There are two more papers I wanted to talk about. These are a little more intense, but very interesting. And the first is a, actually a bioarchive paper. Maybe I shouldn't talk about it. <laughs> <clears throat> Just hint at it. The first rule of bioarchive <laughs> is that you... Oh, no, no. <laughs> bioarchive uh, published in June 15th. It's called Zika virus in the human placenta and developing brain, cell tropism and drug inhibition. This is from a group out at uh, UCSF and uh, it includes um, Joe DeRisi, who has been on TWIV yep. and Arnold Kriegstein, who used to be here, Dixon. Oh, yeah? Neuroscientist. Oh, nice. The first author is Hannah Ritalik. Anyway, what they do here, uh, these, are, these are difficult experiments. They they explant placenta, which is not so difficult. You can get that, you know. Just take a bucket. You could take it oh. at term, but they don't do term placentas here. No. They, they're they actually not terribly infectable. But early, first and second trimester, you can get placental tissues. And they put them in culture they're basically doing organ cultures and, and infect them with Zika. But they can also get brain from first and second trimester uh, aborted embryos. And, of course, their sample size is very limited. But they um, 
make organ cultures. They can make slices of the brain and infect them uh, and see where Zika virus is replicating. So this is a, we've seen a little bit of work on this so far in both the brain and the placenta, asking where's the virus replicating to get some clues as to how it crosses the placenta and what it's doing in the brain to cause uh, damage. <clears throat> so what they find is that lots of cells in the placenta uh, can be infected uh, with Zika virus, which of course provides suggestions on how the, the virus might get from the mother's circulation uh, into the baby. Um, and in particular, these are cells that have contact with maternal blood during pregnancy. That's cancer, right. That's so. exactly right. So the virus would come from the blood to these placental cells and then on into the fetus. And the second paper in this looks at this as well in, in an even more detailed way. Uh, first or second trimester, uh, placental cells were susceptible. Uh, but as you get on, the second trimester explants have fewer foci of infection. They didn't look at third trimester for obvious reasons. You can't get those. Um, so it looks like it, it's sort of in tune with the epidemiological data, which we talked about. You know, the, the later you're infected, the less likely the, the fetus is to be infected. Right. One of, the, one of the points that I wanted to make about this paper has to do with putative cell receptors uh, for Zika virus. Now, last year um, in um, September, a group uh, from France published a paper uh, where they looked at Zika virus infection of human skin cells. It's long before anybody was all excited about Zika virus. Uh, they did a number of studies, but one of the things they did was to look at putative receptors. Now, what they did was they said, for dengue, there are a couple of uh, cell surface proteins that are implicated in dengue virus entry. They're called uh, DC sign, TIM, uh, TAM, and Axel-1. These are um, cell surface proteins. And so they looked at these, and they produced, they took clones, plasmids, encoding the genes for DC sign, TIM-1, TIM-4, Axel, another one called Tyro-3, and they simply produced, overproduced these proteins in cells. And they found that production of either DC sign, which is a, uh, a, co a, a cofactor for HIV entry. In some cases, it, HIV can bind and, and uh, attach to uh, dendritic cells. Overproduction of either DC sign or Axel enhanced viral infection. And they also found that an antibody to Axel inhibited viral infection. Uh, however, an antibody to TIM1, remember that protein, TIM1, did not uh, really affect Zika virus infection. So they said, well, there must be a complex of proteins needed for virus entry that maybe include Axel, AXL, and TIM1. Mm. Now, since that paper, many, many other people have gone on to look at AXL uh, production. You know, there have been lots of studies in neurological tissues and placental tissues as well. And, you know, there's no direct conclusive evidence yet that any of these are receptors. But people are very excited about Axel-1 nonetheless, and you can find, and here they say in this paper, you know, it's been suggested that Axel is a receptor for Zika virus entry. So they do an experiment where they infect astrocytes. These are astrocytes derived from um, induced pluripotent stem cells, and um, they show that a, an, an antibody to Axel protein uh, substantially reduces Zika virus replication. So, so Zika doesn't get far with a broken axle. Ooh. Nice. Nice. <laughs> That's great. So this paper, they conclude axle is probably really important. All right. So that is in astrocytes. They also find axle uh, production in placental cells. Uh, then uh, uh, <laughs> long ago, a paper came out. Uh, oh, what's, the date is August, so it's kind of ahead of print. And I think this is a lovely paper, Um I heard these preliminary results at the Zika meeting at ASM headquarters back in July. It's a co there are two principal investigators here, Eva Harris and Lenore Pereira. Now, Eva Harris is a Flavi virologist. She's worked on dengue for many years. And Lenore Pereira has worked on CMV, which is a virus that crosses the placenta. And she's been interested in how the virus does that. So she's all set up to do placental studies, and she just collaborated with with Eva Harris and did Zika. And this is a gorgeous piece of work. I think one of the best 
Zika paper that's been published so far. It's really systematic. They basically take first uh, and second trimester placentas and they dissociate them into specific cell populations. There are all kinds of cells that make up the placenta, as Dixon and I were trying to figure out right. today. You have syncytiotrophoblasts, you have cytotrophoblasts, you have amniotic epithelial cells in the amnion, you have trophoblast progenitor cells. They actually <laughs> can purify each of these populations and put them in culture and then infect them. All right. And we have human placental fibroblasts too. Human placental fibroblasts. <laughs> they have the the uh, vein, the uh, endothelial cells that make up the blood vessels. There's a lot of cell the types. Fetal and the maternal blood vessels. Yeah. And There's they go through all of these and culture them and ask what can be infected with Zika virus. So first of all, both uh, early and mid and late gestation cells are infectable. It's just that the early ones are more infectable. So there's no mm. absolute block to mm. infection. Mm. The virus can infect a variety of different types of cells. By the way, the syncytiotrophoblasts, these are the fused cells that uh, protect the chorionic villi, the, where the, the fetal circulation is. These cannot be infected. But most of the other cell types that they have isolated can be uh, infected. Uh, and they also show that a variety of cells in the amniotic fluid uh, can also be infected, and they think that mm. we sh when we're thinking about how virus gets from the mother to the fetus, we should think not only of the virus replicating in, in placental cells and moving into the fetal circulation, but also moving into the amniotic fluid and then infecting uh, the fetal skin. All right? mm. So they call this placental uh -huh. and paraplacental mechanisms for infection because it, there is a very nice picture of the placental here, and you can see how uh, infection of some of these cells could lead to virus in the amniotic fluid directly, not just right. in the, the fetal circulation. So there's there's two ways that it can get in there. Anyway, it's a, it's a lovely paper in terms of all these cell types. What I want to focus on here is that they look at expression of Axel and Tyro3 and TIM1 in all of these cells. And TIM1 is regularly expressed. They have lots of samples from different women, of course. TIM1 is expressed in many different cell types in all of their samples. Where's the sentence that says that? I want to I want to read it to you so I get it exactly right. Uh, whereas Axel is less um, universally produced. Let's see. Let's see. Where is it? Here we go. Um, TIM1 is consistently expressed on cells throughout the uterine placental interface in basal and parietal deciduous chorionic villi and amniochorionic membranes surrounding the fetus. In contrast, AXL and Tyro3 expression varied by donor, gestational age, and tissue, and was modulated in culture and differentiating cells. Then they do an experiment where they have a drug. It's a small peptide um, called, what the hell is it called? <laughs> Duramycin. This happens to bind to phosphatidylethanolamine in the virus membrane and prevents it from binding TIM1. TIM1 binding is apparently dependent on phosphatidylethanolamine. So this peptide, it will inhibit TIM1 binding, and this has a major effect on virus infection. So that's in contrast to a lot of the other results we see. These people think that TIM1 is an important uh, entry factor and not Axel. So the bottom line is um, it's complicated. Stay tuned. <laughs> yes. Exactly right. Don't don't just Stay say tuned. it's Axel. Don't just say it's Tim1. It could be a combination. It could vary in different right. tissues. It could vary right. in the brain versus the placenta. But this paper is very lovely and has lovely experiments, beautiful <coughs> figures, a lot of data. If you're into yep. reading this stuff, you should check it out. And, of course, in female ice skaters, it's a double Axel receptor. <laughs> wow. Wow. So um, the the – Observation that there's no or little infection of syncytiotrophoblasts is also in contrast with some other observations. Is that correct? No, the that's other correct. Paper other people have found the same. Syncytiotrophoblasts are pretty resistant to infection. Okay. Remember, that's right. Carolyn Coyne years ago. Yeah. That, right? Yep. Yep. Because they yep. make all the, presumably because they make all those microRNAs. Uh, uh, right. Right. Anyway, yeah, that's consistent among the different groups. The syncytiotrophoblasts okay. are not susceptible, but all the other cells that pretty much that make up the placenta and the interface, they can be infected. And but again, the, yeah, go ahead. But the identity of the, of the Zika virus receptor, we don't know. is still controversial. So this group, we've, got, we've got two good candidates. This group would say Tim one, 
and the other group the other would say Axel. It could be both. Could be both. We yeah. will see. We'll see. People are probably doing knockouts right now and sorting this out, so we'll see what's happening. Anyway, it's a cool paper. I really like it. I think it's one of the yeah. better ones, as I said, that has been uh, published so far. Incidentally, all the papers that we're talking about today uh, seem to be open access. Nice. That's really great. Yes. I hope it stays that way. Speaking of open access, actually, it has nothing to do with open access, but <laughs> I want to tell you about the sponsor of this episode, Curiosity Stream, the world's first Ad-free nonfiction streaming service founded by John Hendricks, a friend of Dixon de Pommier. A personal. And friend. also the founder of Discovery Communications. They have over 1,400 titles, 600 hours of content. You can watch the uh, titles in 196 countries on the web, Roku, Android, iOS, Chromecast, Amazon Fire, Kindle, and Apple TV. So what do they have? A wide variety of science and technology content, nature, history, interviews, nonfiction, right? It's all life as it is. <laughs> it's not fiction. It's not reality shows either. <laughs> they also have 4K content, the high-definition stuff, over 50 hours. So, for example, Stephen Hawking's universe is there. They have Next World with Michio Kaku. They have a whole bunch of programs on viruses. One of them is all about Zika virus, of course. A series called Life on Us that explores our body's biodiversity. And Microbirth, a series that looks at how babies are born and what happens to them later in life, depending on how they're born. So you get real science shows, not reality TV science shows, like the ones on cable TV. They have monthly and annual plans, starting at $2.99 a month, less than a cup of coffee, Dixon. Yes, Vincent. <laughs> Substantially less. $3. I just bought a cup of... Extra large coffee the other day. It was three dollars. Wow. It was delicious. Uh-huh. Check out curiositystream.com slash microbe. Use the promo code microbe during sign up to get unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series completely free for the first sixty days. Two months free of one of the largest four K libraries around. Go to curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the offer code microbe at sign up. We thank curiosity stream for the support of twiv which will allow us to bring for example maybe dixon and alan to asv next year or somewhere else sure travel uh, it will help us next week when we all get together for sure. uh twiv 400 mm -hmm. upgrade our electronic equipment upgrade it yeah all sorts of things now we do have a very large backlog of emails <laughs> and we will not make much of inroads today but we will we, I, I think we really do need to do an all-email episode. You think? Uh, well, maybe, yeah. af maybe after 400. <laughs> yeah. Yep. All right. The first one is from Stacy. Hi, Vincent and all. It's 13 degrees Celsius, 56 Fahrenheit here in Chevy Chase, Maryland. You can tell from the temperature how old the email is, right? <laughs> yes, that's right. I am a stay-at-home mom with a background in art, and I've been listening to the TWIV podcast for many years, usually while I prepare dinner. Recently, The Economist magazine published a graph showing the percentage of measles vaccination across the world from 1980 to 2013. It's pretty disheartening, but worth checking out. It, and she uh, links to this Economist uh, chart. Um, yeah, you got a little slider there. You can move it and see. Mm -hmm. um, it's crazy. Know, it goes up, but there are still lots of areas with um, without coverage. I bring this up because I am currently enrolled in a Coursera database class, and our assignment is to imitate what The Economist does so well with its graphic detail blog, that is, analyze a data source and create a visualization of the data to highlight something of importance. I have been extracting links from microbe.tv slash twiv using code provided to us by the professor. Thank you, Dr. Chuck. And having a lot of fun. But I was wondering if your team or other listeners might be able to direct me to any data sources I might use for this assignment. I am as much a noob at programming as I am with virology, but my interest in both just keeps increasing, and it would be great to merge them. Thanks for keeping my brain happy while chopping many, many onions. I have a <laughs> feeling her assignment is over, but yes, it's cool that she's uh, pulling out the data from... That's scraping, right, Alan? Yes. And can you do that, uh, for example... These uh, sites like Google Health or whatever that track infections, can you can you pull out their data? Probably. It depends on how they've set up the site. Yeah. 
Um, I know government sources like the CDC go to some effort to make their data available um, in ways that don't require page scraping. Yeah. yeah so right. in those cases, you would just need to know what the format of the data uh, has, how, how the how the data have been structured, and then you can you can tap directly into it. Um, but it depends on on how well that's been done. I don't have specific suggestions for stuff to scrape or to to mine, uh, but hopefully she already found that because, yeah. as you say, it's so now Ju- it's now July, and this was for yeah. something in the spring. <clears throat> All right, Alan, can you take the next one? Sure. Will writes, Dear Twivers, it's currently overcast, 16C and 74% humidity here in San Francisco. I'm not sure if you've talked about this on the show yet, but it might be relevant for many listeners. The NSF Graduate Research Fellowship Program, GRFP, is changing the number of times that students are eligible to apply for funding. Any links to the announcement? Previously, students were eligible to apply three times, as a senior undergraduate, as a first-year graduate student, and as a second-year graduate student. With the new system, students are now limited to two attempts, once as a senior undergraduate, and then once as a first-year graduate student, or a sec- as a second-year graduate student, but not both. According to the NSF, this change, quote, should result in more individuals applying as undergraduate students who have not yet made the commitment to go to graduate school. This is a more diverse population than admitted graduate students, end quote. How do you think this will impact graduate student funding or diversity? For Vincent and Kathy specifically, what advice will you give to your students on when to apply? Thank you so much for your answer and all your great work. Hmm. <clears throat> yeah, that's a tough one because we, historically, we have had first-year students apply for these um, to help support them. Not Not being terribly successful, I do like the idea of helping to increase uh, diversity by by catching students earlier. Of course, the downside of that is that they're not yet sure if that's what they want to do, right? So you could support them, and then they would end up not going in the field. Yeah, they also have to. They've got this relies on their being pretty good uh, advising at the undergraduate level. Mm-hmm. Somebody's mm-hmm. got got to be on the ball to advise these kids. But I do like I do like the idea of capturing uh, students early. It says so many of these. So, uh, so many of these funding devices seem to be, uh, yeah, I'm here, I'm already rolling, let's see if we can get some other source of money the, other than what I already have uh, to keep me going. Uh, okay. it, it, it makes more sense to encourage people to pursue science uh, with a fellowship up front. But whether this will work or not, I don't know. You know? Yeah, I just don't Somewhere. know. I- and as you say, these are hard to get. They're very hard to get. Yeah. I think I've had one student over the years get them. Mm. Will started listening to TWIV because of Professor James Shampoo at the University of Washington through an assignment to review an episode. I picked TWIV 254, and now I listen in graduate school. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I think Alan is um, AWOL. uh, Really? Alan? Yeah, his thing thing is... uh, Just read and leave, is that it? (laughs) (laughs) uh, Rich, can you take the next email? Sure. Melissa writes, Love Twiv. Thank you for doing these podcasts. I was wondering if an episode on the virus causing starfish wasting disease is in the works. It would be interesting to learn about this. Thanks. And she gives links to three different uh, PubMed, um, well, hits. Uh, describing the starfish wasting disease. And uh, we have already done this yep. with yes. 315, yep. Um, yep. where we discussed, in fact, one of these papers that identifies a parvovirus, a densovirus, which is a type of parvovirus yep. that is uh, implicated in causing this uh, starfish wasting disease, which was uh, really dramatic. As a matter of fact, if you yes. look at that, TWIV 315, the... Um, the image that we used as an episode image shows the uh, disease, and it's it's really quite striking. They just melt, yeah. Yeah, they just melt. And the paper, the paper is a really good sort of classical virology paper. We did it in some detail in that episode. Does that work uh, on crown of thorns uh, starfish? I I don't know because that's a huge epidemic well, on the. Uh, I yeah, the I think it was not doing anything good. Mm-hmm. No, it was, it was really. To use Dixon's word, decimating the starfish. Yes. One out of ten. 
<laughs> Nixon, are you able to read email? I'm able to read Can email. You read I would love to read Derek. In fact, I like his beginning very much. Dirk writes, Hey, difficult to always greet in a unique and funny way, friends. <laughs> a paper on antivirals from a pharma company that challenges patients with strange drug pricing. Remember Sofo Buvir? But that also makes important progress in the field. This paper describes the most broad-spectrum direct antiviral at the moment. Can we finally match with antibiotics? Sound science, from drug to pro-drug, PK, biochemical analysis, animal models, a lot to learn. And he gives a reference. <clears throat> Thanks for the fine concert. Oh, sorry. No, I can't read. Thanks for the fine content and excellent sound quality. Oh, yeah. that's, a, that's a plug for, uh, for Vince. Yeah, Vince's, I like that. Uh, we have good sound You're quality. a tuner. You're we a have tuner. a lot of bottom. <laughs> I actually read this paper quite a while ago. I put, I blogged on it. Oh. Um, so they it's called GS5734. It's active against Ebola virus in uh, rhesus monkeys, but it was also active against uh, other filoviruses, arenaviruses, coronaviruses. My goodness. The cool thing about this, if I remember, is that it is... So normally you don't want to have compounds with phosphates on them because they can't get into cells. But this has a phosphomimetic that and and it will still get into cells and then it can be further phosphorylated uh, and huh. incorporated into the growing nucleotide chain Look at that. right very cool uh, chemistry which um, gets around this issue let's see if I said uh, uh, after its uptake yeah, it's converted to a nucleoside transphosphate but the the compound itself is of course different from ATP so it it blocks extension. That's very cool. Um, and so they have a lot of, as he pointed out, a lot of cool stuff here, uh, a lot of uh, data, which makes me think they're probably not going to use it. Because as Lynn Enquist always used to say, <laughs> when they publish it, that means they're done with it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. Although they had they had academic co-authors here. So it's yes. uh, Gilead is the company, and then mm. um, there, are, there are folks from USAMRID and... Um, and the CDC and Boston University. Next one is from Thomas. <clears throat> he writes, Hello, Twiv, longtime listener and still working through the archives. So, apologies if this has been covered previously. I had a question about the potential effects of changes in U.S. organ transplant regulations on the evolution of HIV. <clears throat> so, this is a, he sends a link to an NPR article. Uh, this is, um, let's see. It's so long ago, I've forgotten what's going on here. People with HIV who need kidney transplants. Yeah, they're talking about, a, they're talking about a, an organ transplant progr uh, program where uh, they're transplanting organs from HIV-positive people to HIV-positive people. Got it. So his question okay. is, is it possible that these changes could facilitate faster evolution of the virus, even at a small scale, since different strains might be introduced to the same host and could recombine on co-infection? Also, would any of the usual cocktail of immune-modifying drugs given during transplantation alter the virus's chances? I'm sure there's some technical reason I'm missing that might prohibit this from happening, but I can't help but think of a parallel to those accidentally complementary chicken vaccines from a few years ago. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, these are the Marek virus vaccines where two of them recombined in chickens to make a more virulent virus. Mm. Not sure how to quantify that risk, but even if there even is a viable mechanism in order to weigh it against the value of healthy lifespan added, but I can't find a great reason to quickly rule out the possibility. Looking forward to your thoughts. Thanks for your time and keep up the great work. Well, we've been doing the co-infection experiment with different strains of HIV since the beginning of the epidemic. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, people are multiply infected. So there are, you know, for the, the greatest example are sex workers who get multiply infected and they get recombinants and some of those are, are very fit and they end up spreading through the population. Yeah. So, you know, I'm not sure that this would, uh, this is a, a minute scale compared to that probably, right? Yep. Yes. Anyway. Nevertheless, uh, nevertheless, I think he's, you know, he's point. thinking about the problem in an interesting way. It's very yes. cool. Uh, yeah. It is a good point. And also, if you, if you look at this article, uh, the people who are running this transplant program are thinking about this stuff as well. They type the viruses um, that the patients, the donor and the recipient have yeah. before they uh, do the transplant. And they take into consideration uh, things like drug resistance and et cetera and, and, and how that's going to uh, play out for the recipient in the long run. 
Right. And in terms of the immunosuppression, I'm, I don't know how that's going to interact with the usual HIV drug cocktail, but I, I gather these, um, the surgical team that's doing this is, is aware. <laughs> right. We do have listeners who work on HIV. You can weigh in to it at microbe.tv. Alan, please take the next one. Sure. Uh, Jeffrey writes, hey, hey, TWIV crew, there might be a slight chauvinistic bias here, but this paper came out recently from McGill University, where the temperature has definitely warmed up from last week. CRISPR is an incredible discovery, but it is not yet a molecular panacea. Perhaps it's unsurprising that HIV can develop resistance so rapidly, but it does seem interesting that it derives not from errors in reverse transcription, but from the CRISPR-Cas9 machinery itself. Um and the paper, right, so this was a, um, an effort to attack integrated HIV with CRISPR, um, and the virus quickly evolves so that it resists excision by the, <laughs> by the CRISPR endonuclease, yep. which I guess is not terribly surprising. Not at all. You would have uh, so to, the, uh, <clears throat> go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, so the, the, the. The unique take-home message about this is that, if I've got this right, when uh, the CRISPR-Cas9 reaction happens, when there is cleavage at a target, one thing that can happen is an uh, imperfect religation of the um, cleaved uh, substrate. And that act itself, being imperfect, can be mutagenic. And the point of this paper is that that's contributing not just polymerase errors, but the uh, repair of the uh, cleavage itself is contributing to the resistance. Yep. Right. So what they have to do is do is target multiple sites on the genome. Right. Right. So that would decrease right. the frequency of this happening. Yeah. Right. Uh, Rich, you are next. Chris writes, hi, TWIF team. In TWIV 384, you discussed the success of vaccines and our understanding of the correlates of protection. M many very successful vaccines have been developed by merely introducing attenuated pathogens into people. But the reason for their success has not been so much due to our understanding of the immune response and the correlates of protection. It's more due to the fact that in those particular infections, exposure to the fully virulent wild-type pathogen results in most cases, at least, in an acute disease, and then the immune system is able to eradicate the pathogen and protect the person from subsequent reinfection. That took me a while to understand what he's talking about here, but basically what he's saying is that in the successful vaccines we've had, uh, uh, we've picked the low-hanging fruit. Yes. Right? We've, we've, uh, in, we've in picked the viruses where, we, where, where infection is protective. Right. Exactly. Okay. So, so that makes formulating a vaccine uh, easier. Many of the difficulties we face in the development of vaccines to other more challenging diseases are related to the fact that when we are infected with those particular pathogens, the immune system is incapable of eradicating the pathogen and or is incapable of preventing reinfection. I believe one of our greatest challenges is developing a vaccine to protect against or indeed to help treat HIV infection because our immune systems are unable to eradicate the infection. Furthermore, the cells that are central in controlling the immune response, T cells, are very effectively destroyed by HIV. An effective HIV vaccine will need to stimulate a different, much more effective response than the one that is stimulated by natural infection, which is uh, transient and ultimately ineffective. This is a huge challenge, but I believe that because of the massive unmet medical need, we should never give up hope of developing a vaccine <laughs> to prevent I HIV infection. Thanks, and please keep up the good work with TWIV. Well, I think that this is uh, nicely artic articulated and uh, a, a very important point. Yes. You know, that the, the, uh, our whole um, sort of strategy to making vaccines is based on a pretty sort of simplistic idea of how infection and immunity works. And he's pointing out that um, there are much more complex uh, scenarios like with HIV that uh, makes those mm, traditional vaccine approaches uh, less effective. 
Right. This is a pretty Absolute, good summary absolutely. of what, why we don't have an HIV vaccine yet. Yep, or, a, or a malaria vaccine. <clears throat> although, right. Yep. Although yep. with good HIV, point. so HIV does destroy T cells, but the idea would be you have immunity present, and then when you're infected, you stop the virus then. So it doesn't have yes. a chance to destroy your T cells. Correct. I mean, this exactly. is certainly correct on an ongoing infection, yep. but yep. a vaccine would stop that before it got started. Yes. But right. I, I would still argue we don't know what's protective for right. for HIV. Yep. And, it, and you're right that for polio, yeah, we, we gave a modified form of the virus that mimicked a natural infection. Or yellow fever. And it worked, or yellow yep. fever. We don't really know the correlates of infection. Right. But I think for, for HIV, we don't. And we've just learned for Zika, I think. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so are. interestingly, I read a little snippet today in the uh, science magazine that I get regularly uh, that Australia is announcing soon that by the year 2020, they will have completely eradicated HIV infection from Australia. How are they going to do that? They're doing it with a combination of um, chemotherapy, follow-ups, education, sex education, <laughs> condom use. But they cannot. They're not vaccinated. They cannot that's for sure. remove the provirus from infected from the people. people. Who are they, infected. Well, read read the snippet and see what you think of it. How many years did they say? Twenty twenty. No, it's not enough no. time. No that's, way. That's what they said. That's, I appreciate that, Dixon. That's okay. fine. I, I didn't say that, by the way. That, that, that's oh, I know. Thing. Dixon, can you take the next one? I can take the next one. Of course I can. Robert writes, Dear Twiv Lords, especially Dr. Condent, <laughs> your pick of Dune this week prompts me to comment. In science fiction, I feel my expertise to be seriously extensive, albeit dated. <laughs> Dune is, an, is awesome, and the movie, which was started six times before being released, not that bad, but while the premier ecology and geoengineering novel implicitly based on the Israeli experiment experience of that time was not the best, my personal favorite is Mind Swap. I don't know what that is. But a strong argument is to be made for Stranger in a Strange Land. That's Robert Heinlein's favorite. Uh, I argue that the novel of ideas resides largely in science fiction in the U.S. Thank you for mm -hmm. all sharing your expertise and enthusiasm. Uh, Bob, Bob Helen, uh, bioinformatics students at UCSF, USF. Rather. Um, so I have I have read Stranger in a Swain, Strange Land, and I promptly put Mind Swap on my list of stuff. <laughs> right. who, who wrote Mind Swap? I'm just looking it up. Robert Sheckley. Oh. Hmm. How about that? But the ideas do surface from the world of science fiction into reality if they're good, and uh, I guess Arthur C. Clarke is a good example of that. But um, yeah, uh, and H.G. Yeah. Wells and a lot of other people. The novel of ideas resides largely in science fiction. Yeah, I think that might be. People really love SF, right? Yeah, they do because it, you're allowed to take a chance without getting criticized. So, uh, Robert <laughs> Sheckley is Robert Sheckley apparently is an author of some repute in the sci-fi world. I, I need to nice. look into this. Nice. All right, there you go uh, for your reading pleasure on your. Well, I'm Oregon. still, I'm still uh, uh, deeply immersed in the Expanse, which I th I'm on the third <laughs> novel, which I think I picked a little while ago. Lord. Next one's from Raymond. Your guest, Dr. Stuart Firestein, on podcast 385 made reference to a publication entitled 500 Discoveries That Came About by Curiosity Driven Research by a Donald Brevin. I've tried to find this item on Amazon and with a Google search, but with no satisfactory results. Could you hmm. provide a link? <laughs> I've been a regular listener to the Twiv and Twim podcast via the Science 360 radio network, although I have no, no background in biological science. I have enough recall of my grade 13 biology course that I'm able to keep up with the topics under discussion. <laughs> the This Week in podcast provide a very accessible source of information to developments in the field of biological science and does a great deal to raise my personal level of scientific literacy. Great. Keep up the good work. Raymond is from Northern Ireland. I did ask Stuart. <laughs> he doesn't know what he was talking about. He can't find it either. <laughs> Maybe that the book doesn't exist. Maybe he's writing that book. <laughs> it, it would be very interesting, the yes. title 500 Discoveries by Curiosity, but yeah. uh, it remains obscure. Maybe someone has found it. Let us know. Because I did ask Stuart, and he said, I don't know. Uh -huh. and then he, they didn't so, get back so we there. remain ignorant of it. We remain ignorant, which we is do. good. We do. All right. We will do one last round of email, and then Alan is next. All right. Lloyd writes, Vincent, I love your programs and always learn something. Oh. <laughs> 
<laughs> Today I caught a book title. Oh, this is uh, also thing. requesting 500 things we've learned. Um, yeah. And uh, um, then Lloyd adds, I'm a professional horticulturist. One of the early botanists who explored the southeastern U.S. in the late 1700s was William Bartram. He visited many of the Creek Indian towns in Alabama, and one of the Creek chiefs was amused that he was looking for flowers. So he called him Puck Puggy, which mm -hmm. is Creek for flower hunter. Thought it was a good handle for a horticulturist, so I used it. I guess maybe that's his Twitter <laughs> yeah. handle. Nice. <clears throat> Rich. Simon writes, Hello, Conquistadors. I watched a YouTube lecture, NIH vcast by Skip Virgin, about how the virome interacts with humans and with gut microbiomes. Something he said brought a question to mind. He said, I think, he said, I think that the virome of a person is in some kind of equilibrium with the environment and that the influx you get from touching doorknobs and getting coughed in the face means that new viruses are introduced constantly. I would therefore like to hear you guys speculate as to what would happen to the virome of an astronaut right. in the International Space Station who does not have this constant <laughs> influx of new viruses mm. or perhaps to a smaller degree Sailors in nuclear submarines, or just really lonely people, <laughs> <laughs> or bioinformaticians. No, they're really lonely people. <laughs> I realize this is a very open question, and you may do with this as you like. Not that we wouldn't anyway. I just thought it was an interesting idea to study. If somebody from NASA is listening to this mm -hmm. and would like to give me access to their astronauts, just give me a holler. Uh -huh. Kind regards, Simon. The weather here in Karuna, 750 miles north of Stockholm, wow. <laughs> is, as you would expect, quite cold. I hmm. always snicker a little when Alan describes the weather in western <laughs> Massachusetts <laughs> as cold. Right. If you could think that's cold, I would like to invite you to visit Karuna. <laughs> oh, well, time to ride to work on my polar bear. Ciao. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think this is fascinating. It is. One one it of is. my one of my ideas is that you know they people carry up to space and elsewhere such a complex microbiome that uh, I I wonder if it would make all that much difference to start with. Plus, I'm not sure that there's a huge fluctuation in one's microbiome. Yes, you do uh, exchange. It is influenced by the environment, but I don't think there's a huge fluctuation. So I'm not sure that you would uh, would see a great, uh, a huge variation. That would kind of be my prediction, but I think it's a great experiment. Yeah. I think astronauts and, may not be the right population, though. I, I see why you would think of that immediately, because they're high above the Earth, but they're they're getting international collaborators arriving yeah, you know, right. every every few weeks and shipments of food and, and this and that. I mean, there's always something going up to the ISS. My so, guess is the ISS is lousy with viruses. The, the ISS is going to be loaded with viruses and, and <laughs> bacteria and everything else. Um, and, uh, you know, remember when you orbit, you're also orbiting with everybody who orbited there before. Yeah. Um, so that may not be... That may not be as isolated a container as it looks like. Mm. It, uh, and isn't, but, isn't the air full of like floating urine and feces and vomit? Probably. That, that's oh, that's that interesting. It it, it, there <laughs> might even be more exchange. There might be York. more exchange. That's, yeah, exactly. That's, that's, that's uh, I would think, you know, in an isolated uh, uh, frozen place like Karuna. <laughs> <laughs> Or well, like, in that. Karuna, he's got exposure to uh, dirt, to polar bears, and, yes, and animals. I don't think there's any particular place where you would not get. But you know, the key here is that, as Rich said, when you're older and as, as an adult, your microbiome, your biome, they're, they're pretty stable. It's when you're growing up, the first few years, right. when the external sources really influence its composition. Yeah, yeah. I know who you ought to look at. Who's that? Long distance solo ocean sailors. <laughs> How much time do they spend on their they, own? They, depending uh, on what they're doing, they may spend weeks or months uh, without contact with another person. The Vendée Globe is coming up. Rich, I believe November sixth, and it lasts for three months. Okay, the if you make it around pretty quickly, you're doing it in three months. What would the experiment be? You would collect. Uh, you would collect. You would pieces? take a. 
you would take all sorts of samples, feces, skin swab, uh, oral swab, etc., before and after. Mm. You see on the sailboat, they don't want to carry all that extra stuff. Well, no, uh, you, you wouldn't you know, be carrying it on a sailboat. And stuff like that. Actually, they do. They Some of these boats uh, actually carry small experiments uh, with them while they're doing this. Mm. They drop little buoys and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Mm. Um, actually, Kathy... Uh, has read through some of these emails and she left a note here um, consistent with your suggestion, uh, Alan, of, you know, looking in the Antarctic, Antarctic. or the right. South Pole. Um, by the way, uh, my buddy David Bloom has a grant or some funding from the NIH to study herpes viruses in astronauts. I forget quite <laughs> what the justification is, but... Uh, clearly, NASA is interested oh, in sure. microbiology and virology in space. So I would suggest, Simon, that you go ahead and contact him. Suggest the experiment. Um, and uh, if you want to network it, uh, contact my buddy David Bloom at the University of Florida. And uh, he may know people at the NIH who have an interest in this kind of thing. Yeah. Go for, go for it. Houston, we have a virus. Yep. <laughs> Dixon, the last one is yours. Okay. Anthony writes, I'm trying to find the YouTube, but my memory is that Francis Crick later claimed that central dogma was a poor choice of words. He didn't mean that. He was proudly revealing a profound truth. Instead, he humbly was admitting that the evidence that he was presenting was not absolutely conclusive, and so he was asking the reader to take some things on faith. I don't know. As maybe someone knows where uh, this video of Francis Crick is. Mm. I, I haven't found it either. Mm. I don't but, know. But of course, we all blame him for positing the central dogma. <laughs> right. <clears throat> right. But, right. It probably wasn't a good choice of words. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's move on to some picks of the week. Here, here. Alan Dove, what do you have? Uh, my pick, which is uh, somewhat res reminiscent of the uh, the Zika topic, is the CDC's complete postmortem on the Ebola epidemic. Is it over now? Completely From 2014 over? To 2016. It's uh, <laughs> over for now, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, there haven't been any cases in what forty days or something. It, yeah, it's past the uh, the window for for new cases, so it's it's over until the next outbreak. Uh, but this is a really good thorough dissection of the. Mm, yeah, it's wonderful. I mean, it's from the CDC's perspective, so there may be criticisms that they're that they're not mentioning. But uh, I focused on their communication um, related articles because that's my area, and and I thought they covered it really well. Um, and a lot of what yeah. they said about the communication problems they had were, they didn't put it this way, but it was basically you know. People are idiots, and we had to keep putting out fires because the media wasn't doing their job. Um, <laughs> mm. But they put it; they they phrased it a little differently from that. But it it was a a fairly good analysis of of how things went down. Yeah, it's really good. I like it. Rich Condit. Uh, this comes simply from a uh, picture that I saw. I, actually, my wife came up with this. I think <laughs> on Facebook. That uh, a picture that was taken in a coffee shop in Memphis, where you see a couple sitting at a table, and you're looking at the back of yes. the gentleman, and he's sitting in a wheelchair, and there's a sign on the back of the wheelchair mm. that says, this is polio, vaccinate. Um, so I thought that was pretty cool, so I looked up to see where that came from. And it came from a, it's either, a, it's both a Twitter site and a Facebook site. There's also uh, an old website, but it seems not to have been attended for a couple of years. This is mostly active on Twitter and Facebook, and it's called Refutations to Anti-Vaccine Memes. So people post stuff on these sites, either in Twitter or in Facebook, that are little things like photographs or other memes that are refutations to anti-vaccine things. So if you look through those, they're pretty interesting, including mm. this one. Yeah, it's yeah. cool. Mm -hmm. This is a great one. Love it. Mm -hmm. I, I like that this was apparently taken in the cafe at a Whole Foods store. <laughs> right. right. How do you know that? 
Well, they'd said that on the Twitter uh, posting see. of it, that somebody <laughs> saw this. At the, yeah, at the really. So whole that is the audience you need to reach, true. Yep, yep. <laughs> Dixon, what do you have? Well, I have a very interesting uh, video. Uh, it's produced by a group called Metrocosm, and it's a, a brief history of cities. And if you play this video, it will frighten the hell out of you. Because you play it very fast compared to how these cities actually arose. And when you watch this evolve, you will say, oh, my God, that looks like a plate of bacteria <laughs> spreading across the medium. <laughs> and it's, it's remarkable how we have colonized this otherwise humanless planet in less than, uh, let's say, the first cities were 12,000 years old. So that's, that's very interesting. In 12,000 years, really, this is what we've done. What What interested me about this, I watched it, um, Dixon, I liked it a lot. Okay. One of the things that interested me about it is that um, uh, for the first several thousand years, things are just sort of it's, slowly percolating. It's a lag phase. It's a lag phase. That's right. Yeah, but then, <laughs> uh, interestingly, and now you're just looking at cities. You're not looking at people. No. But all of us, after a period of time, all of a sudden, something pops up in China. Yeah, very remote from the Middle East, and then all of a sudden That's something right. pops up in um, uh, uh, Central America. Correct. Okay. Correct. So humans because have people been figured people figured out how to sail. <laughs> yeah. No. No. Seriously. No. no that's, well, I, that's, yeah. There's another. That's how you there. get remote cities uh, showing up along coastlines and and, and that's river ports. That's true. But another explanation would be that that's where farming first uh, arose. And so. Or, the, yeah, right. we're talking specifically about cities. If you looked, if you yeah, traced right. uh, human migrations, it would it would look different. But uh, we're yes, talking about right. urbanization here. So the cities arose after farming. Yeah, as right. the result of farming. So that, right. I mean, that's the the going hypothesis. It could have been something <clears throat> other things too. But when you look at rice, corn, wheat, those are the three places. Yes, and because farming allowed the number yeah, of people yeah, that would exactly be in right. a city. Yeah. Exactly right. yeah. So, Dixon, are we going to make it, or are we going to burn ourselves out? Oh, Jesus. I, you know, I. <laughs> my hope is, of course, that we make it, and we should uh, start doing something different. That's for I sure. think we have, we have the capability. We need the will. That's right. That's right. I agree. All right. My pick is a practical tool. If uh, you use Photoshop or any similar graphics program, which I often do, you often want to cut the subject out from the background. <laughs> right. Not, tr not trivial. And here is an article at what's called the Digital Photography School on how to do that. And they give a couple of quick and dirty tools and methods and more pro techniques. <laughs> you got about a dozen to, to select from here. Yeah. And uh, so the, those <laughs> yes. of you processing your uh, data. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right. Exactly right. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, well, I often have to select things like a virus or something. What, yeah. that nasty little gel with the band that doesn't fit no, you're not anything supposed else? To, you're not supposed to do that, Dixon. <laughs> no, no kidding. No kidding. That's no good. But this is for uh, other things. Yeah, yeah no, no, so no. Check well, it this out. Is a good I find it useful. Very. Excellent. Very, very good. We have a couple of listener picks. One is from Marion Freistadt. As she writes, about 37 minutes, you read a letter from the subsequent conversation. I take it that none of the TWIV group is familiar with the current skeptic movement, perhaps best embodied by Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. Yeah, great. Podcast provides a link, which I would offer as a listener pick of the week. By the way, their major conference is occurring as you podcast on Friday in New York, NECSS, which I hope to attend for the first time this year, and which I guess would be my second pick if I had ever attended it. I understand it gets grave reviews. I would characterize contemporary use of the word skeptic as a rational approach to life and living, not as, quote, not believing anything, unquote. It is very pro-science. It is also being shaped by what it is against. Namely, it is against woo, pseudoscience, and anti-vaxxers. Other than that, it is, at least in theory, not ideological. It is also separate from atheist or humanist movements. All right, thank you for that. That really clarifies it because if you just look at the word you would think it's a it's against everything, right? Right. But it's not. Uh, Jenny writes, Dear Twivom, here is a short video about the conservation and study of the leatherback sea turtle in Costa Rica, including an awesome rap song at the end about mm. turtles. Mm. And it's a lot of fun. So listen to it. Thank you, Jenny. Cool. 
<laughs> I heard it. I heard someone playing. <laughs> hey, somebody yeah, played. I, I muted it. I muted it. <laughs> you can find Twiv at iTunes at microbe.tv slash Twiv. Please send us your questions and comments. Twiv at microbe.tv. Wait, 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 wait a minute. What's the matter, we're dude? <laughs> we're done? What do you mean we're Are done? Are we quitting? This The, the episode is over? <laughs> Yeah. I'm just getting into it. It's an, hour, it's an hour and 45 minutes, you know. You'll have okay. to save it up for the next one. All right. Sorry I'm glad you're still I'm up. glad you're still with us, Rich. Well, if, if you'll just take a seat, we'll be with you in a moment. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, that's okay. I'm glad you like it because we're uh, we're here for the next uh, few months. And there's, there's forever. No, no more we're here gap. forever. We're here forever. There are no big gaps coming up like we had, no. you know, a few weeks ago. As far as I can tell, I'm here. Yeah. Throughout the, the uh, rest of the year, I'm not going anywhere. Yeah, yeah. Just short trips. So there you go, twiv at uh, twiv <laughs> at microbe.tv. That's our email, and you know your email may be in the queue. We'll get to it. I promise. <laughs> we'll get to it. We'll do an email episode. Although people, some people don't like e- all email episodes, but then know. other people uh, do like them. So yeah. that's right. No, Let's tough do. Bean. And we love they, them. <laughs> they just like the, I want to please everyone. That's yeah. the, no. by the way. I I think as part of this, we should start collecting. The names for our group and list them somehow and take a vote. See if everybody likes, you know. What names? Twiv- Twivologists oh, and Twivologists. Oh, 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 I have right. them all here in the all notes. All those. Notes. It's fantastic stuff. By the way, we, as you know, we've been experimenting with advertising. We also were experimenting with crowdfunding, having you support Twiv. There are many, many thousands of you, and some of you may like to support us. It would, as I said, help us to do some different things. It's not that we would like to make money, but we would like to travel. We would like to do some new stuff, which would involve getting some help and so forth. So a couple of ways you can do that. You can go to Patreon, patreon.com slash microbe TV, and you could subscribe to Twiv or to microbe TV, all the podcasts for a buck a month or for whatever, whatever you want to give. And that would be great. A buck a month is nothing. And if all of you, gave us a buck a month, or if just 5,000 of you gave us a buck a month, that would be awesome. We could do so much. So consider it. It's not a lot of money. And if you don't want to subscribe, some people want to just give some money, you can go over to microbe.tv slash contribute, and we take PayPal or credit cards over there. You can give us a little money. Or you don't have to. This is free for everyone, and if you don't want to contribute, that's fine. But we'd, we'd love to get your help. Dixon DePommier yes. is at verticalfarm.com. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome, Vincent. Pleasure to have you. It was good. You think so? I know so. Absolutely. I feel like Rich. I, I wish this would uh, go on a little bit more today because I, I too was into it, as they would say. <laughs> Alan Dove is at alandove.com. He's also on Twitter as Alan Dove. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Rich Condit is an emeritus professor at the University of Florida in Gainesville, but he is now the wandering virologist. There you go, the itinerant virologist. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough, always a good time. And I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another twiv is viral. <laughs>